Welcome to the Bronx Latino History Project. Today is March 1st, 2024. My name is Pastor Crespo Jr. I'm the research librarian here at the Bronx County Historical Society. And today I am joined by Jose Rodriguez, a Bronxite and an artist. Uh, and we are joined by his daughter also who will be here and you might hear her chime in here and there and add to this oral history, Aya. Welcome Aya, welcome Jose. Would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Pastor. Uh, yeah, just simply, my name is Jose Rodriguez. Um, I'm born and raised in New York City. I'm an artist, as you said, um, and uh, that, that is an introduction. That's about it, as far as it goes. <laughs> great, great. You know, we like to start out all our oral histories mm -hmm. by asking you, you know, to talk about your family history and background. And tell us a little bit about each. Would you, and, and you have an extraordinarily long history here in the United States. You know, can you start out with, uh, you know, your great grandparents? Uh, yeah, uh, I think it, it was my great grandparents that first came uh, to this country. My family is, is uh, from Cuba, uh, my mother's side of the family. Um, and my father's from Puerto Rico. Uh, but I grew up with my mother's family uh, from Cuba and, uh, in my great grandparents were the first ones actually to come to this country um, long before uh, the whole Castro revolution and people escape, escaping communism. My family has been here since the late 1800s. Uh, they left during the Spanish colonial times um, because back then they were a biracial couple uh, living in, living in Havana. And uh, my, my grandfather, my great grandfather uh, was a Spaniard, um, and he was married to an African woman, a descendant of, of, of slaves. And one day he stood up in the church and he, he yelled at the top of his lungs, "You call this a house of God? And I can't sit next to my wife. Este la casa de Dios." <laughs> and with that, he left uh, the shores of Havana and arrived in Key West. Um, and the first census records, I believe, that I found was 19, uh, 18. 80, 80, 85 or something like that, 86. It was, anyway, uh, slavery was still going strong in Cuba, and I think it had just uh, been abolished here in the United States, so they thought they would find a better situation and wound up in Key West. Um, later, they moved to Tampa, Florida, and eventually by the 1940s, uh, they were here relocated in New York and at Barrio. Spanish Harlem. Great, great. And you recall like the year and the area in El Barrio where they settled, where and when they settled? I, the earliest record that I found, I think, was the 1940 census, and it was on on 116th Street in the heart of El Barrio, right next to La Marqueta. Um, and uh, I still remember the address, 110 East 116th Street. And, the, and of course, that building is still there. <clears throat> Um, it was Spanish Harlem uh, in terms of the, the residential population, but most of the businesses at the time were all uh, Jewish-run businesses, pretty much. So they had their, their schedules, uh, were a little bit different from our church-going schedules. And, and as kids, we used to love it because in such a condensed neighborhood, you can't go out and play while the businesses are running because it's just... 116th Street is a main thoroughfare of shopping and, and, and business. So on the Sabbath was the only day those businesses were closed. So we had the run of the streets in those days. <laughs> right. There were no shoppers, no, no, no businesses running. So for kids, for us kids, that was the best time. <laughs> can, can you, as, as you were remembering there, could you tell us about your earliest memories of growing up in El Barrio? What was it like? How did you feel? Well, we lived right there. Uh, just a block away from La Marqueta. So that was the, our, our, our main shopping venue was right there in La Marqueta. Around the corner, there was a Hispanic movie theater, El Cosmo. And I remember going uh, to see those, those uh, I think at the time they were predominantly Mexican movies. Uh, one of the big stars that my mother often would like to take me to see was Cantinflas. I don't know if you remember Cantinflas. 
he was he was a, a popular Mexican actor from the '40s. He played the, you know kind of a typical Mexican peasant. He had a little mustache, but I don't I, I don't know that much about him. Um, but apparently he he was he was like the darling of of the Latino film world. Uh, uh, so the whole neighborhood was Latino in that regard, um, in terms of the the little bodegas and and. But any businesses that dealt with goods that we needed and services that we needed um, were all kind of uh, white owned. Uh, what decade was that when you were running around 160? Well, I was born in 56. Got it. Um, so we're talking about maybe, and, and I moved up into the Bronx by the third grade. So what is that, 1960? So we're talking about the late 50s and very early 60s that I was living in, in East Harlem. Um, but one of the early mem memories I remember, because the, the market was just such a lively place. You know, we had live, live produce and uh, the seafood was live. I remember it w going with my grandma to buy seafood and she had bought crabs that day, and, and it was a fun thing to actually have them by the string and almost kind of walk them home like a pet. <laughs> but it was something that, as a food source, it didn't, it didn't sit well with me because she would just throw them in the pot, and you could hear them scratching and trying to get out. And I said, no, I will. I'm not going to eat that stuff. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah. Wow. Do, do you remember when, while still living in El Barrio, the types of meals that Abuela or your mom made? Uh, we arroz con frijoles, basically black beans and rice. You know that was something very different. Uh, we noticed uh, uh, because in in my Puerto Rican friends, they didn't need black beans. Right. You know we had black beans at home. Every once in a while we had red beans and rice, but that was not the the, the food that we ate on the daily. You know, um, but other than that, you know chuleta, bistec, uh, plátano maduro, and of course, on the holidays, it, we didn't make pasteles ourselves because in Cuba, I think uh, the more common type of pastel is really a tamal okay. uh, made from corn. Uh, so we used to buy them from the local, uh, the local uh, woman who, who cooked them up with her family because, uh, you know, it's a two, three day affair to, to make pasteles, particularly in those days. Right. Yeah. You know, grinding by hand. And, wow. Yeah. And uh, do you remember the types of music that your mother and grandmother listened to while you were growing up? Oh, at that time it was all, uh, for the most part, it was straight up Cuban music. Me voy pa morón, orquesta Aragón, a lot of charanga. Um, Machito was a big thing. Celia Cruz was a big thing, even though they were big on the salsa music scene in general. But we kind of held a special place for them because they were Cuban. <laughs> you know, they were not. They were not like Willie Colon and and uh, Hector Lavoe, who who were Puerto Rican at the time. So, um, but at the time, I remember growing up, that Latino culture was. It felt like it was everywhere. Because we had our television stations, we had our radio stations, and, and in the house from morning to night, that's all you heard was the Spanish music television and the uh, Spanish music radio and the Spanish television stations. Um, so I didn't really get to know English that much until I started going out on the street on my own and going to school. Oh, wow. um, and of course, the bodeguero, they all spoke Spanish. Uh, so. It was it was it was very different. Later, the, the bodegas were owned by, um, and I was surprised when I came back from my travels, they were owned by Middle Easterns. And it was surprising to me because on the surface, when you look at them, they don't look very different from you and I. If we were walking around Egypt, we would probably get confused if we could speak the language. So I'm talking to them in Spanish, and they're like looking at me like, "Oh no, I I'm sorry, I don't speak that." And it, it, it was interesting to see how that demographic of the neighborhood changes. We still had the same bodegas, but it wasn't at the bodeguero of old who was running it. Right. You know. Yeah. Did you have any siblings? I was an only child. I grew up, but uh, my my mother comes from a large family. She had uh, ten siblings, uh, nine siblings, and, and if I count her, it's ten. Um, seven sisters and and three brothers. 
Right. Um, so I have buku cousins, um, but uh, no, no, no brothers or sisters. No. And did you guys all gather in La Casa de Cuca? We gathered in La Casa de Cuca every every <laughs> week from Friday night until Sunday. Uh, people had to go to to work the next day. They would gather. Uh, there was always a card game going on, whether it was rummy or poker. And it, it was not even limited to the family. Everybody in the neighborhood knew there was a card game going on in Kuka's house. So, so a lot of people would come by and, uh, and play cards. Um, yeah, and, and for us kids, it was great because we got all the cousins got together. And in the, in the, even though we had a five-room apartment, there was no room for everybody to sleep. So we would, we would take the two chairs and put them together, make beds like that, wow. or uh, pull out the cots and stuff like that. Um, also, because my grandmother's house was kind of known, um, mind you, since since we had been in the country all of this time, our family, um, by the time the 50s and 60s rolled along, you have people escaping from Cuba now with the revolution that's going on, on there, mm -hmm. um, which was different from my grandmother's time when she was living in Tampa. They were back and forth all the time because it's just a boat ride away from from. From Miami or from Tampa to, to Cuba, I think it's like a 45 minute boat ride or something like that. So they were back and forth all the time. Um, I think my, my grandmother was actually born in Tampa, but my mother was born in Cuba. So it was that kind of a thing. Um, but by the time we got to New York in the, in the 40s and then the 50s, you had the Cuban Revolution. Uh, my grandmother's house became a hub for people trying to seek a better life. Uh, other family members, other relatives, they always spent a period in Abuela's house, in Puka's house, before they found their situation and moved off to, to other places. Got yeah. it, before they springboarded on their own. Right, right. And then they maybe moved out to Brooklyn, Coney Island, or, or uh, I guess Jersey City, uh, Union City is a big Cuban wow. population up there. And you, but you have a pretty much ethnically diverse, you know, extended family. Well, Can yeah. you talk to us about some of them? Well, no, because like I said, my, my, my mother had seven sisters and each one married into a different nationality. Um, but the interesting thing about my family, it's really kind of a matriarchal family because of that. Um, the men tended to leave and the women stayed and brought other men, <laughs> and brought their husbands in. Um, so I have, I have a, a I mean, I, I'm speaking in the present tense, even though some of these people are no longer with us. But I have a Hindu uncle, uh, an Irish uncle, a Jewish uncle, a, a Bermudan uncle, African American uncle, wow. um, Filipino uncle, and with these card games, every weekend was like the United Nations getting together. Um, um, and, but you know, I I think that that's kind of what, in a way, prompted me to branch out and seek out and travel. To other places uh, far off, and eventually, it led me to Japan, where I met my, my wife, and uh, and my daughter was born uh, in Japan. Um, but I, I kind of see that as not so much as as it it could be taken as a rebellion that I just want to get out of here, kind of a thing. But I kind of see it as almost, in a way, fulfilling. The legacy of my great grandfather, who got up in church and, and said, "This situation is not working for me. I'm going to go find another one." Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that that kind of wanderlust is kind of what drove me to seek other shores. Um, yeah, you know, and we're definitely going to speak to that in the latter half of uh, yeah. of, of this interview. And that's that's pretty remarkable. But also, just the, with, within that. <clears throat> That, that experience growing up in that family situation, you know, it allowed me to, to of course, I had the Spanish um, of, my, of my, my, my mother's family and that ancestry, but I had also the, the Hindi language coming from my, my uncle who lived right upstairs from us in the Bronx. Um, and, I, and, and being able to, to kind of listen to, to these very divergent languages and ways of communication, I think it, it, it kind of helped me along the way when I started encountering other cultures where I found myself in places where I didn't need to speak the language at all, mm -hmm. but I was still able to somehow find a way to communicate. Um, 
from that because of that experience, I think. Right, right. Yeah. You know, being so familiar with so many different you know right. ethnic groups growing up, exactly. You know, exactly. it's easy for you to to cross cultures in that way. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And um, so you're in El Barrio. What? When did you first find out that you were moving to the Bronx, and when was that? Well, we moved around a little bit um, before coming to the Bronx. Okay. Um, my mother and I. Uh, when I say move around, I think. I think she was trying to work some stuff out um, because my father had left when I was about three years old. Um, so obviously three years old, that's preschool, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, on her own, she was just trying to work some stuff out. So we spent a stint living with my aunt out in Queens and in, in Jamaica um, before we had uh, moved to the Bronx. I did kindergarten in Queens. Um, but then we were back in a barrio because I remember I went to PS 57. Mm -hmm. Um, up until the, the, the third grade when we moved to the Bronx. Um, but we moved together with my grandmother and everybody from 116th Street because her eldest son uh, was living across the street from where we moved uh, on Clinton Avenue. And I think he was, he was already like on, on knocking on death's door and she just wanted to be closer to her son. So she, she moved the whole family up there to the Bronx. Got it. Got it. Um, and what, what are your earliest memories of, you know, you said you grew up at 1805 Clinton Avenue in the Crotona Park area. Exactly. You know? Just just north of Crotona Park. And it was a great little neighborhood because it was kind of a cul-de-sac. Um, we, we were bordered on, on, on one side with Crotona Park North, and then we had the park, which is now the Roberto Clemente uh, baseball field is there. Mm -hmm. um, and the tennis courts are there. There's a lot of, a lot of sports. The Indian Lake is there. Um, and then we had 175th Street and Clinton Avenue on the corner that we lived on. The next block over, there was a playground. Um, that street, I looked at the map before coming here. They, they're calling it the Cross Bronx Expressway, but really the Cross Bronx Expressway was underground, under that playground. And the, we used to call it Dead Man's Hill <laughs> because the, 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 the hill just ends and turns. There's no cross through. So our little block was really kind of a cul-de-sac and we just had the run of the block. There were not many cars coming through. Um, and, and that Dead Man's Hill was, was uh, <laughs> the source of a lot of broken, <laughs> broken <laughs> arms and legs. And we tried to go down there with our skateboards and uh, homemade, homemade scooters and stuff. <laughs> Got it. So now you're, you're, it's the mid sixties, you're eight, nine years old. You're in the Crotona Park, north of the Crotona Park, you know, in the Bronx. You know, tell us your earliest memories, you know, hanging out and, you know, playing with your food. What kind of kids games did you play? Well, you know, back in, back in those days, that's, we kids practically had the run of the streets. Um, they, it was not, we were not living with the kind of fear of that, that our communities have today that you can't go outside. I mean, there was a little bit of that, particularly in, in the dark of night, you didn't want to be caught in certain places. Um, but our life was pretty much on the street. We came home just to eat <laughs> and sleep, and we were play, we were playing games like uh, the big the biggest game I think that everybody enjoyed was Scullies. Yes. And that's, that's a little uh, a, a street game where you draw the board on on uh, in chalk on the street, and you use bottle caps to to navigate the the game board. Um, it's a little complex to explain without any visual introduction, but it's a simple game that that we play. Um, Ringolivio, Hide and Seek, of course, Tag, those simple games. Johnny on the Pony was a big game that we played. Um, but a lot of times there was just nothing to do except throw the ball against the wall. <laughs> and, and we had this sweet spot on the wall where the ball would pop up and we would play points, throwing the ball on, on, on the molding of the, of the brick wall. And then if it flies, you catch it, you get a point. If it doesn't fly, you, you lose a point and you pass it to your, your, the next team member. Um, but when we first moved there, it was a very diverse neighborhood. Okay. Um, I think we were one of maybe three or four five-story buildings on the block. Um, across the street from us were, for those two blocks, were pretty much all uh, two family homes. And there were a couple of actually uh, private houses on the block uh, at the time, you know, A-frame uh, kind of wood panel type uh, private houses. Mm -hmm. 
and um, and it was still a lot of the old infrastructure uh, was still around. Um, I remember not all of the sidewalks, for example, were concrete yet. They had the old slate flagstones. Okay. Yeah. And, 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 you know, those are things that I remember, those little details of textures and stuff. I guess because I'm an artist and the visual is what appeals to me. That makes me recall it too. Yeah, yeah. But those, the flagstones, and, ah. and we didn't have really cement sidewalks back in those that. days. We still had wooden telephone poles. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, by far, we, we, you know, we had the Katona Park there, which was, is a huge park. Um, particularly if you're eight, nine years old, <laughs> it's, it's immense. It's bigger than Central Park, I think, for sure. And then on the other side, we had a playground, which blocked us off from uh, from from the, the general traffic. Um, so we really had a nice little private uh, block there, and, and we could play without any fear of getting hit by cars or anything like that. You know, we, we ran the streets, yeah. And the big and the biggest fun in the summertime was, of course, opening the Johnny Pump or what what they call the fire hydrant, and just getting the heat off. <laughs> right. Because you know those days, no air conditioning, none, none of that kind of stuff was was even on the market, uh, at least not in our neighborhoods. But, uh, yeah. Amazing, amazing. Now, so you know, uh, looking at your timeline, you're in middle school now. You know, tell us what middle school you went to and. And some of your earliest memories of where your middle school was? Well, I, I, I went to elementary school at a kind of a transitional uh, period. Um, at first, we had elementary school, junior high school, and high school. Mm -hmm. The word middle school was not something that we had. Right, right. And the way that they broke it up, if I remember, you went to elementary school up until the sixth grade. Yep. And then seventh, eighth, and ninth, and ninth was junior, junior high, high, and 10th, 11th, and 12th was high school. Yep. But they started this thing called the intermediate school at the time. And they were shifting. Elementary school, I think, was supposed to end on the fifth grade. Mm -hmm. um, but I was at the tail end of that, so I had already started the sixth grade. Um, so I started mid middle school or intermediate school, IS-144, not far from here, as a matter of fact, um, seventh and eighth. And my high school was a four-year high school, so ninth was high school for me. Got it. And 10th, 11th, and 12th was, was high school, yeah. Now, you went to middle school in this area, right? Not far from and, here, and Gun, we're, Gun we're Hill in Road. The, we're in the Norwood area near Gun Hill. Crotona Park is not a walk. We were, Talk we to were, us we about were that. among the first people who were bused. Got it. Because I was actually slated to go to the local junior high school a block away from me. Um, but because of the transition, and and I don't know how much of this is true, it probably is. The, the rumors of the time was that's where the kind of lower achievers were going. <laughs> they didn't <laughs> want to put the smart kids there for some reason. <laughs> You wanted to export the smart kids they and wanted, bust them. They wanted to export the smart kids to see if they could change the society or something. I don't know. Uh, but they bust us up, um, and it was a handful of us that, that came from the neighborhood uh, to go to this pretty much an all-white school. Um, and the only thing we knew about this area was that, oh, that's where Freedom Land used to be. Apparently, there was a big amusement park here at one time, and people used to come up here for, for that. Um, yeah, I remember you telling me uh, an anecdote of a uh, of an incident in your social studies class. Oh yeah, Where, yeah. Talk to us about that. That's <laughs> pretty interesting. Miss <laughs> Pizarro, <laughs> I still remember her name, Miss Pizarro. So so uh, there were there were a few of us who were bust up. Most of the kids in my neighborhood were not in my class because they. I got to admit they did bust up some of the underachievers, you know, they had to have somebody up there too. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> I shouldn't say stuff like that. <laughs> um, but there was one other kid, a black kid, who, who came from the same, uh, my class in elementary school, because um, they, they had put us in the SPs. Uh, we were in the one classes and they put us in the SPs in, in intermediate school. Um, and we were the only two color kids in the class. And we came from the same neighborhood. <laughs> 
but we lived a few blocks away. I didn't see him after school. He was a, a classmate of mine from school, but after school, I played with the kids on my block. You know, there was, we didn't play block to block, although we went to the same school. Yeah. Um, so we had an assignment to do a political cartoon, quote unquote, in, in our, our seven year, seventh grade year minds, whatever that meant, um, about Abraham Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation. And lo and behold, the only two colored kids in the class <laughs> come up with a similar idea about the ramifications of slavery and put that into a cartoon. You know, what, what, what does it mean? <laughs> and the teacher swore that I copied. And here I am, the artist in the class, and she swore that she's accusing me of copying from my friend. And, and, and it's like, oh my God. I, I was devastated as a child. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't do anything except whimper home and, 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 you know, with my tail between my legs. But I'm secretly under my breath. I'm saying, wait, you wait, Miss Bizarre. Wait to be, I become a teacher one day. <laughs> and uh, eventually I did become a teacher, but I never forgot that episode. But I think the greater lesson I learned is that, no, if you're going to become a teacher, you don't want to treat your students like that. You don't want to be, become the, 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 the oppressive teacher that, that you, that you, that scarred you, uh, you want to be something better. So now, I mean, uh, junior high school, uh, intermediate school, the late sixties era for you, uh, I'm trying to catch the type of music that was going on and you were listening to, and you noticed during the, the intermediate school era. Well, I mean, it's New York city. And even though, I'm growing up in the Bronx in a Latino neighborhood. And my family is very much Latino in culture, if not in the, the, the makeup of the individuals. Um, but it's, it's, New, it's New York City. Mm -hmm. It's the 60s. Rock and roll is king. You know? <laughs> I grew up listening to, to uh, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, uh, The Doors, uh, the Rolling Stones. I mean, you, I'm not a, a musicologist to, to, to list all of those, those, uh, sure. those bands, but you know, I, I was very heavily influenced by, by that. Um, at the same time, at home, I was listening to that old Cuban music. Which is, which, which is not really the salsa that everybody was, uh, was listening to, mm -hmm. um, because it, this was the music of my parents' generation. You know, it was not the contemporary uh, Willie Colon and Hector Lavoe uh, salsa music um, that other people were listening to in the neighborhood, because I was, I was kind of already drifting culturally into that uh, rock and roll uh, mindset. It wasn't until later that I began discovering uh, salsa, quote unquote, um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a musical genre. Uh, if, if that makes any kind of sense. Yeah, I, I, um, absolutely. Because we use the word salsa to talk about Latin music, but not all Latin music is salsa. Absolutely. You know? um, and, and a lot of the stuff that I was listening to may be formed the root of what salsa became, but it, it was really like old school uh, stuff. Septeto Habanero and Moqueta uh, Aragon, and these, you know, these, these, are, these are people from the 40s and, and 50s of my mother's generation. Um, that's not what the young Latinos were listening to in the city, yeah. um, which I came to later. Um, and, and now, Now we see the music, it's, it's, it's all over the place, you know, because the, the, the Latin music phenomenon just hit the world in a way, like we were talking before, even though you don't see the Puerto Rican demographic anymore in New York, the influence in the world music is very strong, Definitely. you know, Definitely. And, and, and even though people are not creating this music anymore, there's not a band that you don't see that doesn't have a conga drum and a cowbell now, for example. Because that's the influence of our culture, you know. 
Um, so now I think I, I, that kind of plays in, in my work also by coming full circle. Um, and I, I, in my, my artistic career definitely ties on that uh, cultural. Yeah, and, and, and I yeah. kind of wanted to touch on that before I hit high school, mm -hmm. you know, because obviously you went to uh, you went to a high school dedicated to art, right? you know, and, and we'll let you talk about that. But who were you, what were your first influences in art? Where did you, did you have a mentor? How did you get involved in the art scene? There was not a lot of art, uh, really. Uh, I mean, unless you count music. I mean, nowadays people have a broader understanding of what art is, and, and yeah, there was music all over. I mean, it's just the nature of our, our, our culture is, is musically uh, inclined. Uh, but there was very little art uh, to be seen in my house growing up. Um, so, but I, I don't know what it, where it came from. I just exhibited a talent, I guess, uh, in school. And my teachers kind of delegated me to do to be kind of the class artist in a sense. Whenever there was a uh, like a school play, they would have me do the set designs and the costumes and think of stuff like that. Um, they would call me even even in, in the in the math class. They there was one time in in, in middle school um, where they were producing this kind of a magazine to kind of get us interested in math, and they had me do the illustrations and and stuff like that. So. Um, so it was just something that I exhibited in a way. Um, the closest thing that we had to, to art uh, in my house was that ubiquitous picture of Jesus uh, with the flaming heart and, and the, uh, what, do you, what is it called again? Ah, uh, yes. The stigmata, the stigmata on his hands. And the light brown hair with blue and eyes. the light brown hair with the blue eyes and the blonde beard. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. And as kids, she kept this in the hallway of, of our apartment. It was like the long railroad flat, and there was a hallway running through it. And she always kept that in the hallway. And as kids, the, the hallway was the best place to, place to play when you couldn't play outside because you had that almost like a long runway, <laughs> almost like, a, a, what's his name, Tom Cruise in Risky Business sliding, uh, in, right. <laughs> sliding in, in his underwear. And as we would run up, run up and down the hallway, we, we would swear that the picture – that the eyes of Jesus Christ were following us, <laughs> okay, <laughs> like like in the old the monster movies, and and we said, "Did you see? Yeah, look at look at he's going to watch you. You can't do anything bad." So, but with that, it kind of bring home the impact of the visual image and and that how that visual can kind of impact the world and and kind of in, in, as a child it, it impacts your behavior in a sense. Um, so that was the closest that we came to art um, through school. And I got uh, invited to certain uh, extracurricular things um, because of that. I remember one year, uh, Saks Department Store, they had a program where they, they brought kids in to learn uh, like watercolor or something like that. I remember going to uh, like my mother taking me to that uh, program um, when I was very young. Uh, but, it, you know, it's the kind of thing that even in spite of all of that, because of what I exhibited, the, um, nobody really ever asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. It's just that that's what was in front of me, right. you know. And one thing led to another, and here I am. And how did you uh, tell us about the high school you went to, and how did that uh, end up being an interest in yours? Well, I, you know, through all of that uh, process, um, again, the, the, through teachers, you know, they, 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 they see that you have a certain aptitude in a certain way, you know, because as, as a young child, you, you don't know. You just know that you have to go to high school. You don't know where you're going to go or what. You know, you, you rely on your teachers and the people around you to kind of steer you in the right direction, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, they, they had uh, recommended high school art and design and music and art. Um, I think there was one other art high school in New York at the time. I forget. Um, but... Uh, 
me, I tended to always take the path of least resistance. Uh, so when I applied for high school of art design and I got the response, I said, okay, I'm going there. <laughs> I got a positive response. That's where I'm going. Um, I think the other high school was the high school of music and art. Music and art, yeah. Yeah. So I only applied, I think I, in the end, I, I wound up only applying to that one. And it, it turned out the same thing with college as well. Because I, 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 was, I was on track for applying to, for Pratt and Cooper Union. And, and I, 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 my, my process with Parsons was already through. And they gave me the response. So I said, yeah, I'm gonna, why, why, why do I have to trouble myself with all of this other stuff? If I got a response right there, I'm going to go for it. Got it, got it. Now, you well, know, going back to high school. Yeah, before we get to Parsons, you know, <laughs> let, let's hear about that that early '70s, you know, phase of yours. You know, well, the thing about high school was because of being a vocational school, it's kind of what I think what they started to later call kind of a magnet school mm -hmm. because you didn't have to go, you didn't have to live in the district where you went to school in. So people came from all over the city to go to that school. So it was a very diverse school. Um, and I think it, 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 it really brought out a kind of solidarity between the different ethnic groups. And in particular, Black and Puerto Rican tended to kind of gravitate toward each other um, at that time. But we, but we had uh, people coming in from Chinatown. We had people coming in from da uh, Jackson Heights who were Latinos, but they were not necessarily uh, Puerto Ricans or Caribbean mm -hmm. Latinos. They were coming in from Colombia or, or other places, Venezuela. Um, so in high school, that opened up that whole uh, experience of, of really s beginning to see the variety of, of cultures and, and whatnot, um, which in a way was a little bit different from what I was exposed to in my family, mm -hmm. because that was my family. Even though they, they were Hindu and Filipino and that, they were still in my family and they were living among us as Latinos mm -hmm. and they, and, and they knew how to speak Spanish and they knew, you know, we, we were connected in that way. Whereas in, in high school with people coming from different ethnic groups, they were strictly Chinese and they, they, you know, they're coming in with that whole mm -hmm. cultural uh, experience uh, with them. So that, that kind of opened up a, it in a different way for me. Um, now, but you you were going home every day during high school. I was going home to the Bronx. What, I was what was in the Bronx. what was popular in the Bronx in that time, music wise, as far as what you experienced? Well, I think that Ray Barreto, Eddie Palmieri, uh, Willie Colon, uh, a big thing at the time. The early Fania although I didn't, I did not go. Yeah, Fania, but definitely, um, I did not go myself. But the talk about was about uh, uh, this place called Las Villas. And that was like a, a resort town upstate. And I think uh, in particular, Puerto Ricans had a tendency to frequent Las Villas. Um, and they had a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of performers came up there to play, you know. Um, and I th and, and uh, but yeah, that, 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 that early days of salsa, um, Of course, being a rock and roller at the time, I didn't even know that Tito Puente had done Oye Como Va before Carlos Santana. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, the Carlos Santana was, was a hook because he's another Latino and he's singing in Spanish, but he's doing rock and roll. Right. You know, so that, 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 was, that was a... a a hook, and then later I realized um, uh, the Tito Puente version. But what I was kind of tuning into at the time, more so than salsa, was the Bugaloo of the day. God, yep. Uh, Joe Batan, he, uh, Joe Batan, I think it was Filipino. Uh, uh, Joe Cuba and his sextet, Bang Bang, <laughs> and because uh, they sang in English, but it was a straight up. Latin music, but with English lyrics. So that, that was kind of an interesting thing as well going on at the time. 
Okay. And before we get out of high school, what did your neighborhood look like? What did the South Bronx look like at that time? Well, the Petroleum Park area. It was a, it was a, when we first moved up there, it was predominantly Jewish and Italian. Um, as a matter of fact, our landlady lived in the building. She, she lived in the apartment right across the street from us, Mrs. Winters. Um, and, uh, and again, it was, it was almost, it was a very idyllic time as a young child growing up there. It was really free. You didn't have any fear about going out on the street and, and walking by yourself. Um, we, we played freely on the streets. What, what was your, your, um, your mother's friendships like at that time? Because I know all the, your mother's friends in my neighborhood, you know, they had a hook on. We couldn't go anywhere without my mom knowing exactly where I was, you know. My, I mean, again, we have to understand that the time that we live in. I, I think the whole idea of friendship in my mother's generation, it definitely was not the same idea of friendship in my generation. And, you know, I think their sense of community, I, I, I guess they had to rely on each other because they, you know, they grew up in the depression. You know, this was, that was a whole, a whole different time, depression era life. Mm -hmm. um, and on top of that, we had such, I mean, with 10 siblings, who needs friends? <laughs> you know? So, but to get, but I think I know what you're getting at. It was a community sense. And even though it was not the same sense of friendship, everybody's mother was looking out for everybody else's mother. And you couldn't do anything wrong without your mother finding out. <laughs> you couldn't do anything wrong. Um, my mother used to call me Flaco back in the day. Flaco para arriba, you know, come, time to eat. She would, cause we lived on the second floor. Um, so that was her life, li looking out the window of the second floor and watching, watching the world. And, and if she needed me, she could yell. And, and I was just a block away and, and, and I would come. It was, it was uh, that really, I don't even know if there's a word to, to describe that, but it's a bygone time. Right. We, right. Didn't, we never locked our doors at night. Uh, and, and, you know, there was always somebody home. You know, you can always have a pot of coffee and, and a relative will come by, yo huelo cafe, you know. We're going to yeah. go to a Casa de Niña because there's always a pot of coffee and we can sit down in the kitchen and have a little conversation. And people would pass the time like that. Just, just sitting down in the kitchen, having coffee and, and talking. Oh, look at the time! I gotta go. <laughs> you know? yeah. And that's and that's that's the way that's the way uh, the, that's the way it, w it was in the neighborhood. And and again, we lived in the little uh, kind of a cul-de-sac. Um, so it, it was uh, it was kind of a, a a quiet neighborhood, and and it seemed pretty much everybody was coexisting. But then I'm wondering what happened. We had the blackouts one year. Mm -hmm. And all of those, uh, my landlady, for example, she was, I, be, I believe she was a, a Holocaust survivor, uh, a German Jew. And a few of them had businesses in the area. And, and, and with the blackout, the lootings, and a lot of people got hurt. Um, and that was a terrible time. I forget what year that was, but it was, I think it was the 70s sometime. 77, 78. 77, 78, the blackout, the what big are those blackout. Years? Mm -hmm. I remember. Because I wasn't here. And after that, that's when the white flight really started coming strong and people started moving out. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and the, the city changed. Not, not for the first time and not for the last time, but the, the, the city changed. Right. Yeah. So now, the, I mean, the, you know, we're, we're talking the mid to late 70s, right. you know, the blackout era, you know, right. time frame. You right. know, you're in what college now? You graduated the School of Art and Design. I, yeah, after that, I went to the School of Art and Design. The timeline is a little confusing to me. I thought the black the blackouts were a little bit earlier than that, um, because I remember we were just we, we were just we were Bronxites. Mm -hmm. By the time I started going to college, it, it was like I was kind of I guess I was still living in the Bronx. Yeah, I was still living in the Bronx. Um, 
but at that time, you know, I'm, you're you're a young adult and you're you're you're, you're stretching your, your wings and you're all over. You're all over. I was not in the Bronx as much um, as 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 it felt when I was growing up and all those games and street games and all of that, you know, stickball and Ring the Leave You and Yeah. But um what was your question again? Yeah, so tell us about your experience, you know, entering, you know, Parsons, you know, School of, uh, yeah. what is it? Parsons School of Design. Parsons School of Design. Right. You know, how'd you get in there? How, how could you afford that? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I got a grant. Uh, they had a, they had a, uh, what at the time they called it the BEOG, Basic Educational Opp Opportunity Grant. And that was a grant for, uh, uh, which was which was a common grant for inner city kids. Got it. Um, kind of like the Pell Grant today. Kind of maybe like the Pell Grant today. Yeah. Um, and I, yeah, I, I applied for for Parsons. I applied for Pratt, um, and I got my response from Parsons first, and I and I just went. Um, again, I w I get back to the point that uh, nobody really asked me what I wanted to be when I grow up or what I wanted to do. Um, but they did try to counsel me and say, okay, if you want to do that, then you at least better get some skills where you can get a regular job. Right. You know? So you should study like advertising or something like that. Um, so I, I, uh, in Parsons, I, I continued that. I went uh, for communication design, which is basically uh, advertising and graphic design. Um, and I stayed there for three years. And uh, at the end of that uh, career, I just began to realize that I've been, this is not what I want to do. Mm -hmm. I, I have, I, I granted, I have this skill, I have these talents, but I don't, I don't want to do this with it. I don't want to sell soap. Um, and I had finished my three years of studies there, um, of, of art, uh, practice studies, and I had only one year of academic uh, classes to go. That's the way they had it set up back in those days. You had three years of art training and one year of academic. Mm -hmm. And they did not want to give me credit for the things that I wanted to study. Uh, for example, I wanted to study Spanish, and they wouldn't give me credit for studying Spanish. Um, but I was, I was able to find the summer before I had gone to this Outward Bound School. Um, and uh, because there were no summer jobs to be had that year. So that was the only thing left um, for our inner city uh, kids that year. Uh, got there a little too late. Um, and one of the leaders of that school uh, was looking into um, something for himself. And I, I expressed to him, I said, I'm kind of dissatisfied with the way my training is going here. And, and, and I really don't want to go down this road road anymore I'm kind of disappointed so he said well maybe what I'm looking into maybe this might be of interest to you so he handed me the brochure of a small uh, school by the name of Friends World College um, which was kind of an alternative uh, college at the time uh, just barely hanging on to their accreditation by the Board of Regents um, uh, so I, I, I applied to them and uh, the next year I found myself in Guatemala um, and I was studying, uh, among other things, the, the traditional arts of the, the Mayan people there. Um, and that's all because uh, after three years of studying art in, the, in art academia, I came to the conclusion that this is not what I want to do uh, with my life. And, and uh, one thing led to another. Wow. Yeah. So the Friends World College, right? Friends World College. And you're, you're in Guatemala. <laughs> Tell us about your experience in Guatemala. Where did you live? Who did you live with? Well, How I was, was that experience? Well, I was still living in the Bronx at the time when I, when I joined Friends World College. Um, and the Bronx was still, it was still livable. <laughs> and not that it's not now, but, you know, it was, it was, it was still the same, the same city, that I, the same town that I had left. And, um, of course, changing my 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 track like this my mother was all up in arms and like 
what are you doing? <laughs> you know, why are you going to go so far away? Tu quieres ir para Guatemala, va a encontrar Guate peor. I don't think that translates into English. But, but uh, needless to say, um, maybe there, there was a, a, a little bit of snobbery towards other <laughs> Hispanic experiences down in South America. Or south, south of the border, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I found myself in Guatemala, and I believe that was 1977. Um, and literally learning Spanish for the first time, um, because I'd never really studied Spanish. I only learned Spanish from what I spoke at home and uh, what I learned through music. Um, which is not necessarily grammatically uh, correct. Um, so I, I was I was studying there, and um, I had to study because I was not a native speaker as I thought I was speaking with my own family at home. You know. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, in Guatemala, I lived with, uh, for six months uh, with an indigenous family up in the mountains, uh, and and their their life was totally different from the life that I had known in New York City. Um, because uh, growing up, as a kid growing up in the Bronx on welfare in the neighborhoods that, we're, that we live in, um, we're told every day that we're poor. We understand ourselves as poor, even though in our life at home, we didn't feel any of that. We, we, we didn't understand what it meant to live in poverty because we were so rich in our relationships with each other and in our culture. And sure, we didn't have, you know, all of the amenities of life, but we had love and we had the camaraderie, we had community, you know. I didn't know what poverty was until I went to Guatemala. Tell us about that. Um, where you don't have running water. You have to go to the central uh, plaza, to the fountain to get water in a pot and walk back to your, your home carrying it on your head. Um, forget it, no electricity, uh, gas, cooking on a stove. Your stove is three stones on the ground and, and charcoal uh, with, with a, a clay uh, pan laying on top of it. Um, the, house, the houses, the walls are made of corn stalks, uh, milpa as they call it. Um, and the floor is the earth, the earthen floor. Wow. Um, so I was in Guatemala learning how to wash my hands and, and fruits and vegetables before I eat them, even though my grandmother always told us you had to do those things because she remembered a time back in Tampa where you really literally had to do those things. Uh, but, you know, growing up in, in the 60s in New York is the, the lap of convenience. Everything is, everything is uh, at your fingertips. Mm -hmm. um, so we didn't know poverty yeah yeah sure we had to get a welfare check every every two weeks we had to go to the the office for face-to-face -face interviews every every couple of months or so but in terms of daily life living life i've seen people living worse in south carolina than we live in in the bronx where you have to go to the bathroom in an outhouse for example you don't have indoor plumbing uh, even in this country, mm -hmm. but in Guatemala, it was like that everywhere. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Now you spent six six months with the family in I the spent, mountains. I spent I spent six months with the uh, to be specific with the Cachiquel uh, Indians uh, in San Antonio Aguascaliente, just outside of uh, Antigua, Guatemala, which is the old capital, um, up in the mountains there. Um, and then I spent six months with an urban family. Um, I forget their name. Uh, uh, but, but the father, the, the man of the house was a presidential chauffeur. Oh, wow. Um, so he worked for the government, uh, uh, driving, driving the, the high officials around. Um, and even he, in his house, they didn't have a refrigerator until the day that I was leaving. Whereas here, in, you know, in the lap of poverty that we live here, you know, there's no apartment that does not have a refrigerator and a gas stove. And, it, you know, if, if you don't want to buy a TV, that's on you. But everybody has a television, uh, hi-fi, stereo. <laughs> you know, 
we probably had two TVs in the house. Um, but I guess, comparatively speaking, we were poor. Um, but it was not a mindset. We would we did not define ourselves by our conditions. You know. Right. Right. Wow. So you, you, you spent a year in Guatemala. What was next on your uh, Friends of World College experience? Uh, well, one of the, the policies of the school was that you had to study in two cultures other than your own. Um, so being that I, I was born in, in New York, um, you know, the United States was out. Uh, and since my family, you know, is Caribbean, um, I, 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 although early on I thought I, I tried to get to Cuba through them, um, but the time being what it was, there was still no real transportation at that time. Uh, not until much later uh, I was able to get there. Um, so what was the second country you went to? So from there, I, I, I went to uh, Japan. I found, I found myself in Japan. Um, I, I was thinking maybe I would go to India because I had the influence from my my uncle who, who lived upstairs. Right. right. Um, but I, I, I wound up set, staying in Japan because Japan is a kind of a place, a little bit like quicksand. The more you kind of try to get out, the more things kind of get your interest and pull you deeper, deeper, deeper in. Um, but after that, I went to Japan and I stayed in Japan for a year and eight months, um, which at the end of that brought me back to the Bronx okay. um, to make uh, I don't know if we're ready to come full circle back to the Bronx yet. Um, Not yet. Could, could you touch on, you know, your significant happenings and experiences, you know, uh, in Japan for you? What were the families like? That my, my daughter's got to leave. Um, well, the first thing was, it was the first time that I found myself almost, almost deaf, dumb, and blind. Okay. I didn't speak the language. Um, I had a very kind of a romantic impression of what uh, I thought Japan would be like. Um, from the art that I've seen and from the, the classical movies that I've seen. I was not prepared for modern day Japan the way it actually was. Um, and it was just, it, it was just such a different, uh, down to the, the way that they make rice. It was just so different. What city were you in? I arrived in, Tokyo, the first day. Um, back then, there was not a direct flight. Uh, it was like through China Airlines. We had to go from, from New York to Anchorage, uh, from Anchorage to Seoul, from Seoul to, to, to Tokyo. So it was, it was kind of like a long, right. a long uh, haul uh, to get there. And at the time, you know, I was young. I was traveling with a backpack and like this huge, huge backpack. And it's like, I don't travel like that anymore. <laughs> So I found myself in Tokyo not speaking a lick of the language, but my school was in Kyoto, all okay. the way on the other side of the country. How to get from point A to point B, I had no idea. I found myself somehow in, in the Ueno train station. And in Japan, it's different from, from uh, Tokyo is different from New York. New York is a city that never sleeps. So you can take the subway 24 seven and it's always popping they start shooing people away after a certain hour. They close the station. You can't hang out there. No homeless sleeping in the station. And here I am, I don't speak a word of the language. I, I, I know where I have to go, but I don't know how to get there. <laughs> Finally, the, the cop is coming around. He says, you can't stay here. Excuse me, I don't speak Japanese. I don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> so they keep talking to me, and I still don't understand what they're saying. Somehow they find somebody who speaks English, and he explains the situation to me. Um, and I said, yeah, but I, you know, I'm, I'm new I, I, to this country. I don't speak the language. I don't, I don't know. He said, okay, well, anyway, the station's closing. We, they, they found a little corner of the waiting room, and they locked me in there 
and they let me sleep. With my backpack as a pillow, and I slept stretched out on the floor, and I slept in the, in the, gotcha. in, in the train station um, until the next morning. And they, they found me on on the, the the Shinkansen from Tokyo to Kyoto. And then that day I arrived in Kyoto, I took the very last trolley because they were dismantling it and, and taking it out of commission uh, and finally arrived at my school. <laughs> and who'd you live with in Japan? In a dorm or with it a family? Was, well, French Wall College is, is not the kind of college that you think of where you actually go to school. It's a, yeah, I, French Wall College was not really that kind of school. It was a, a university without walls program. So it's not like an institution where you go to classes and, you know, they have a dorm and that kind of a thing. Um, the, 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 the center in Japan uh, was actually an old Japanese house um, that they, you know, it was just an old Japanese house that they occupied. Um, in Guatemala, it was just even, uh, all they had really was office space. Um, but in Japan, they had an old, old Japanese house. And when I first arrived, that's where I stayed, um, in that house. But soon, um, a group of us got together and we rented a, a, another old Japanese house. Um, because Kyoto is, is really the old uh, imperial capital of Japan. And you st that's where you still see a lot of that old traditional culture, like the geisha and maiko and a lot of temples in, in Kyoto. Yeah. So, um, how do you immerse yourself in all that new culture? How did I what? Immerse yourself. What did you do? I mean, other than studying, how did you participate? In well, that? you being there is a total immersion. Um, and I think that that was kind of the premise of Friends World College. Um, for example, if you want to study a language uh, like Japanese, rather than going to a class and studying from a textbook, you immerse yourself in the culture and learn from daily life how to speak. Um, so that, that the curriculum at the school was one of immersion. It's like, you know, when you teach your kids to swim, you just throw them in the pool and hope they, hope they make it back to the, <laughs> back to the edge, right? right? It was that kind of an education. Um, so I, I was just without, you know, like a babe in the woods, you know, not even able to ask, excuse me, where's the toilet? Because <laughs> I really got to pee bad, you know? How was your daily life, though? So, so what did you do in this immersive college, you know, without walls in a foreign city, you know, on a daily basis? Did you do reports on a weekly basis? Um, well, we, uh, it was a little bit different structure from a, the normal type of education that you think about because there were no reports, no book reports, no term papers to speak of. Um, and also, it was a student design curriculum. So you pretty much kind of had a, have a handle on your direction of what it is that you wanted to study um, because it was incumbent on you to find those experts in the field um, and work directly uh, with those people um, and design your curriculum that way. Um, so that, that uh, my approach to learning was uh, it was just one of, of that total immersion. And the language learning part of it was kind of interesting um, because our, we, uh, they did provide us with a language teacher. Um, and she used a kind of experimental uh, teaching method called the silent way, um, which was actually developed in Spain by some Spanish uh, psychologist um, in which the teacher actually does not speak at all. Um, and it's, it's the, the, the learning is generated by, by the students, uh, uttering utterances, mm -hmm. um, which was useful being in Japan because you're constantly bombarded with Japanese language and sounds and not being able to make any sense of it. So you might say, so you just hear a sound, ah, and you, in class, you say, ah, and the teacher takes your sound and associates it with a color, say red, for example. And every time you say, ah, she points to that color, points to the color, ah. Okay, so then you begin to associate 
the sound with the visual color. Then the color changed the shape of the Japanese letter. So you see the letter A ah, written in red. And okay, then you begin to associate the writing, the letter with form, with the sound. Then the color turns to black. So you only see the letter. So that, that's how we learn to read and write um, Japanese that way. Uh, Got it. Yeah. Now you, you've, you know, obviously you're in school, you, you're there to learn, but, you know, you're a Cuban, Puerto Rican, in Japan, you know, what you do in your personal time? How'd you, how'd you meet friends? You know, what outlets did you have while you were there? Because you spent a year and eight months. Yeah. That's a long time. Well, but I, I think also we have to, we have to remember is it will also was a different time. We didn't have to rely, for example, on the internet to meet people. You just meet people because that's you. You're in the room. Hey, how you doing? It's a nice day today, isn't it? <laughs> you know. People, I think people were much more open to each open other. to each other. Yeah. Um, and. And Japanese people are very curious, so they'll approach you. They'll approach you, they'll think that, that you know, often it's under the guise that they want to practice English. Right, right. Um, but but they'll, they'll approach you. Um, and and you, you start building networks of people and, and uh, um, pretty much like that. Great, great. Now, um, I mean, the key people who I met that I was learning from, I met somehow through some kind of a connection with the school. Um, because I, I, I had a, a calligraphy teacher, um, and I was interested in, in the traditional arts. So they, they connected me with, a, for example, a, a, a bamboo worker. Um, uh, so those, those kind of connections uh, were kind of set with that. I worked with a paper worker who, who makes scrolls, and, and uh, paper paper is, is, is a, a very widely new, used material in Japan, um, even in architecture. Uh, paper is used, um, uh, not simply like papering walls, but walls actually made out of paper. The doors, right, and, right, yeah, um, like those doors that they were moving. The sliding doors, sliding right, doors right. Made of paper. So that that that's a particular uh, skill set, a particular craft industry, um, traditional. Um, so I got I got connected with somebody who does that kind of work, and um, yeah, but it, but it's it's a kind of a thing, you know. It's such a different place that everywhere you turn, there's something that you can uh, kind of that draws you in. Particularly if if, you, if what you're studying is art, um, and and you know the way I approach my work, it's kind of a solitary. You know, I'm an only child, as I explained earlier, and and uh, I've been a loner. You know, because when you're when you're working on your art, it's kind of a solitary. Uh, occupation. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that, that kind of a thing uh, didn't really phase me. I could be isolated and, and not, not be able to uh, communicate in that way because I had the visual uh, to communicate, you know. Um, but eventually I learned, I learned uh, Japanese. Um, and I think one of the real uh, benefits that I had in in, in my corner was being bilingual already um, because <clears throat> phonetically there's a lot of similarity between Japanese and, and Spanish. They have the same cinco vocales, I, U, E, O. We say I, E, O, but they say I, E, U, E, O. Um, every sound that exists in Japanese exists in, in Spanish, um, but we have some that don't that are harder for them to pronounce, like the jota, they, they can't, or the r, they don't, they don't have those sounds. Um, so in that regard, it was very easy for me to learn to speak and to listen. Now with the writing, having studied with my uncle Hindi, the setup of their alphabet is very similar to the setup of the Japanese alphabet. It's, it's what we call a syllabary, uh, as opposed to an alphabet, where each letter is a syllable. Is not just a, a, a basic sound. So, ka, ki, ku, ke, ko. It's not a ka. Ka is a letter all by itself. Um, 
Uh, so, the, so the way Hindi is set up, it's also similar to that, where you have the parent sound and then you have all the syllables following that. So that, with those two things in play, I think I had a, a lot of an easier time than the other, uh, my fellow students who, who were white and only knew English. Um, so. Now, you, you talk about um, getting stuck in Japan. What do, you, what do you mean by getting stuck in Japan? <laughs> well, I got, you know, this is after your year, right? This was after my year. Uh, I, I, uh, my intention was to stay for a year because I only had one year of uh, financial aid left. <laughs> so <Got it. laughs> I had to graduate, you know, or, 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 or drop out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, but one year came and went. And I didn't have the funds to leave, first of all. And then second of all, I was having a good time and I didn't want to leave. <laughs> because the more I, you try to, to get out, the more things that captivate you and kind of pull you down. It's almost like quicksand. Um, so I wound up staying there for a year and eight months. And when all was said and done, I, can't, I had to come back to New York with a certain amount of urgency um, because that during the time while I was away, that was the period where, excuse, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitating because I want to say something and I don't know if it's appropriate for time, time prime time. But that period is was where the shit hit the fan. Right, right. And I was getting letters from my aunts because my mother didn't read or write. Um, so so she, they would write for her and explaining about what was going on there. The landlord had changed hands like five times within the year. And some charlatan was coming ab around saying that he was trying to get money to, for the rent. And, and it was like a, a, a very untrustworthy situation. So it's, I, I really had to go back and try to make heads or tails of the situation. Um, so when I get back to the Bronx, um, jumping back from Japan again, it, it bounces back and forth. Um, so far, okay, people are moving now. Everything is okay. The building is not full and like it used to be. My, my aunt had already moved out. They were living in Jackson Heights. It was my mother and maybe one or two other families. At the end, it was only one other family who had just come in from Puerto Rico. Uh, and the rest of the building was empty. Out of 10 apartments in the whole building, the rest of the building was empty. Uh, and before you left, they were all occupied. Before, it was all occupied. The whole neighborhood was occupied. That, bu that building was the only one that was still standing. The, 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 the two family homes were still there, but the bigger building, the one across the street where my, where my other relatives had been living for all those decades, was totally leveled. I think it's a brand new building there now. Um, and uh, I, I, it's kind of hard to, to remember, but I think the old private houses were also all gone. Um, yeah. So you we returned to a remarkably different Bronx. Very, very different Bronx. And at first it was it was okay because we were still living there. I mean. There was there was no uh, there was no heat because of the you know the landlord was gone, mm -hmm. but we, we we used to heat with the stove in those days. The Con Ed and the oven was on, mm -hmm. which is totally dangerous and a health hazard as we know today. Yes. But you know we didn't know any better in those days, and there was no but no advocacy program like Better Get Bacaro or Shame on You, David Diaz <laughs> in, the, in those days. You know you were you were on your own, and like I told you, we had to go. That, that, that following winter was the coldest winter on record, which I, and I don't know how many years. And the temperature dropped so low that the pipes froze in the building. I looked it up and you're absolutely right. Yeah. 1980 was one of the coldest winters recorded, you know, for the Bronx, New York City. It was during Christmas. And we had Christmas in my aunt's house. And, and, and that was the first Christmas that we couldn't do in my mother's house. So we went to my aunt's house in, in Jamaica, Queens. And I had to come back the next day, Christmas Day, just to check on everything. And I saw the, the, the pipes. I came back by myself. And, and uh, oh, my. Oh, 
Talk to us about the, the condition of the apartment. What, what did it appear like? Well, the pipes froze, so that was okay. Everything was frozen. But then the spring thawed. And, you know, when the pipes freeze, they swell and they burst. So then the thaw comes, and then we start getting rain in the bathroom. So we had to go down in the basement and shut off the main valve and turn off the water to the building. Otherwise, we would just be living in pipes flood. Were all cracked. Yeah, the pipes were all cracked. So from that point on, we started getting water from the fire hydrant. And, and, and at that time, my now wife, a then girlfriend, her first time outside of Japan. So you came back from Japan with a wife? <laughs> with a girlfriend. At the with a girlfriend at the time? Yeah. You well, mind she, talking about, about her a little? I, yeah, my daughter's not here, so maybe yeah. <laughs> she left. <laughs> so yeah, uh, she had come because she wanted to study abroad, but this was her first time. She's from a small uh, uh, island. You may have heard of it being with your military background of Okinawa. Absolutely. And um, which is a whole nother historical story, which <laughs> we won't get into right now. <laughs> They probably hold the same fate as Puerto Rico toward Japan as, as Puerto Rico to the U.S. Exactly, exactly. You know, an occupied that, territory. Exactly, exactly. Well, but on top of that, in her lifetime, it was the United States that was occupying them. Right. Uh, previously, up in, you know, up until the war, it was Japan that was occupying them before her birth. Yeah. Right. She was born in 50, 50 yeah. After and that was the U.S. military. That was the U.S. military, which is still there, yeah. Um, uh, but anyway, she's from this small island, and, and because of my, my, my <laughs> Bronx life, she, she tries to call me country. <laughs> Where, um, so she, she's, she's in New York for the first time, and these are the conditions that we're living under in the Bronx. Um, but she doesn't know New York from anything, so she thinks that this is the way New York, New York is supposed to be. You know, what, what can you say? Right. Um, but I, I, just as an interesting antidote, uh, she first arrived uh, on, a, on a, a tourist visa. So she had to go down to immigration to, to transfer to a student visa and get her paperwork done. At that time, it was in the World Trade Center, but the Twin Towers were still standing. Mm -hmm. And the immigration office was in, in one World, World Trade Center. And, you know, a kid who grew up in the Bronx and went to school in Manhattan, and, you know, we got east side, west side. You got the number two line, go down the west side, number five, go down the east side. Mm -hmm. And then you just come right back. World Trade Center, get off at such and such a stop. She gets down there okay. But somehow on the way, on the way back, she gets turned around and I guess doesn't find the proper train station where she's trying to go to. So, you know, downtown Manhattan, the, the, the financial district, mm -hmm. uh, there's a certain demographic that's walking around down there in the train stations. Um, so she's asking everywhere, everyone she can find, can you tell me how to get to the Bronx? Oh, wow. Excuse me, sir. Can you tell me how to get to the Bronx? No one in that area has probably even thought about the they Bronx. Said, they, they heard the word the Bronx. They didn't even stop walking. They just said, no, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> Finally, she sees this colored person, and she asks him, can you tell me where the Bronx is? And he says, oh, yeah, sure, I'm going that way. Just just, just come along. It was still, you know, you can still trust people in New York. Right. <laughs> yeah, so just come on along. So finally, she, she, she's on the right train, I guess, and, and, and uh, all through Manhattan, it's, it's the subway. But then you come past 138th Street and uh, 3rd Avenue, and it's little by little, the train's coming up above ground. And then she realized, oh, I'm in the Bronx. And then when she finally sees the burning building in the distance, then she finally feels relaxed and at home. And finally, wow. I, I, my destination is close at hand. <laughs> <laughs> and it took the, the, the devastation of the, the dilapidating Bronx to make her feel comfortable. <laughs> right, right. Whereas the, the, the high society of Manhattan downtown was just a... We didn't even give a her quagmire. A we wouldn't give her. We wouldn't even give her a second uh, notice to help her on her way. That that is amazing. <laughs> now, you know, uh, talk to us a little more about how you saw the Bronx as a whole. I know you talked about your apartment and coming back mm -hmm. to all the problems in the building, and you know, how did your neighborhood look to you now? I mean, can you describe it to us? You know, the sights. I. 
I haven't been there in a long time because you, your question is how does it look to me now? Um, so well, I, I, yeah, I can't quite answer. Oh, answer no, my that. apologies. How did it look to you, you know, then? How do you remember it looking in 1980 when you returned the first time? You know, now your girlfriend is coming when back. I, when I returned the first time, the, the only thing about that disturbed me, I re, you know what? I, I remember the, 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 the car ride home from the airport, now that you mentioned that. Because my madrina, my aunt Julie, she, the one who lived in, in uh, Jamaica, like 15 minutes away from Kennedy, she always picked the, uh, me up whenever I came into town. And um, I remember her driving me from Queens along the Van Wyck Expressway, Grand Central, and then coming up on the Cross Bronx. And for the first time, looking out the window and seeing block after block after block of rubble there were no buildings left standing that was it was a shock wow. to see the neighborhood that i grew up in that, that i loved so much as a child the freedom that we had to just roam the park and and all of the ethnicities that we grew up around yeah. and then coming home and and it looked like a war zone. I couldn't believe it. Now it's 1980 in the Bronx you're talking about. This uh, is 1980 we, in the, the Bronx. The last conversation we had was 2024, just a, a week ago. Right. And you made a, 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 a starking similarity, mm -hmm. you know, on how the Bronx looked today. Do you remember that? Well, that yeah, quote? because, um, you know, with the time that we're living in today, you we're bombarded with the news of Israel and Palestine and what's happening in the Gaza Strip. And, and to look at those scenes of, of the devastation of, of, of buildings and rubble and, 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 and people still moving around and living in those conditions, um, it just reminded me of that time in the Bronx. Now, granted, there was not a war going on. Mm -hmm except maybe Nancy Reagan's war on drugs. But within how, that's, that's what I'm, that's what I can't not wrap my head around is there's no war actually going on. How does something like that happen to an entire community? With, under the very noses of the powers that are supposed to be protecting, you know, under the very noses of, you know, which, you know, this may not be the place for this type of a conversation, but it, it, it you know, it, it, it begs me to wonder, was this part of the plan all along to get people out so that we can now build and bring our people back in? Yeah. You know, from from you one know. settler colonial, colonial nation to another settler, another settler colonial, colonial nation, yeah. you know. And, and, you know, I, 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 I try and rather not to think in those terms, and I'd rather try to think of humanity as being better than that. But it doesn't seem like much has changed, you know. Right, right. Wow, amazing, you know. And that just, it just, it just stuck with me, the comment you made, you know, the, the Bronx in 1980 looks like the Gaza Strip of today. Of today. Yeah, that, that was just a very powerful statement, you know, that opens eyes, you know, and I, I definitely appreciate that. But but that and, the, and I think that, that that's what I'm getting at. I think it was a concerted effort. It's not an accident that these things fell by the wayside. Right. You know, why would it? Why should it? If you own a building and people are paying rent and you have a lucrative business going on. Why? Why would it? You know, yeah. unless you ha unless something else is at play there. Yeah. Right. Now you're you ended up leaving the Bronx again. You know. Yeah, we want we want to uh, because I came back. We were in that situation, um, and my mother was, uh, <clears throat> you know, she she was, uh, she was still in. You know, her life was her life. You know, she was still um, receiving. Uh, SSI at the time, 
uh, because she was a senior citizen. She was legally blind. Um, uh, and um, she was dependent on the, the city to make her ends meet. Um, you know, food stamps, the whole nine yards. Um, so we, we had to move out of that situation, but she was caught in the CAS 22 of Section 8, and she was waiting for the city to give her approval because we could not move unless the city first approved uh, the unit that she was going to move to um, because they were the ones who were uh, footing the bill. So we were stuck, you know, and, and we called the city and to explain to them, look at the, we know we got to get out of this place. Look at the condition. They said, okay, but you can't move yet. But what it did was they condemned the building because they saw this building is not inhabitable. Okay, you condemned it around us. We're still living here. You know, we got it. We, we still have to find an apartment. Um, but, you know, it was a cast 22. So finally, we found a place in uh, close to Washington Heights, um, Hamilton Grange um, area of, of uh, upper Manhattan. And, um, uh, that was the straw that broke the camel's back for my mother. Uh, because here she was, she was used to all her life living like in this kind of small community where she's on the second floor, she, she can talk to the neighbors and, and, you know, have that interaction with the street. Um, and she had to, and, and I think even in of the years that we lived in El Barrio, even though it's still Manhattan, um, it's, it's a much more manageable neighborhood. Um, than some other neighborhoods. Washington Heights is crazy. Th those buildings are huge. They have, I don't know how many apartments on each floor. Um, so she found herself living on the fifth floor of a building with an elevator with I don't know how many apartments on the floor. Um, and it was a nerve wracking thing for her. You know, one day she went down to pick up her check out of the mailbox and she got mugged in the building. And it, she never was the same after that, you know after that experience. Um, so, uh, yeah, we left the Bronx. Wow. wow. Uh, so, but, but not because we wanted to, but because there was, you know, there was no place to stay anymore at that point. Got it. You know. Now, when, when does the University of Wisconsin come into play? How oh, far much, much, was much that? later. Much, much that's, later? That's much, much, much later. I All mean, right. I, my, my daughter was already grown and, and going to graduate school on or she just finished uh, undergraduate college. Um, um, but we were kind of in graduate school almost at the same time, actually. <laughs> I went, I, you know, I had always kind of wanted to go back um, to graduate school. Um, and when I finished Friends World College, um, NYU had just opened a major uh, in folk art, which was kind of what I was interested in. Um, but their their bent was more the study of folk art as a phenomenon, mm -hmm. not as a practice of making. Um, so it was a little bit different from what I was uh, thinking about. Um, and then life got in the way. I had a, I had a two year old daughter, and you know I had a, I had to think of putting her through school. And you know you become a parent, and 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 life 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 goes on. Right. Right. Um, but but eventually we were living in. She was already going to. She went to Parsons also. Uh, eventually got got accepted. Um, so we were living in Japan, and she was living in New York by herself at the time. Uh, and you know, like with the empty nest syndrome, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> so I figured. I, I started looking into schools, and uh, uh, I applied to a couple this time. Uh, and, and Wisconsin was just one that, that responded. And there was a professor there that I was interested in working with. So uh, it kind of led to that. Um, but that was, that was, a, that was an, again, a different thing in my experience, educational experience, because I, I thought that I was going back to school to kind of learn more skills and, and develop my repertoire as an artist. But it quickly became a, a question of, I don't need to really get any more skills. I could probably teach at that school with the skills that I have. Right. Uh, but it became a question of, OK, so what is it really that you're trying to say and do with your work? Uh, so that, that became a different 
uh, Rahat focus? What is it that you, you're trying to present? What is the body of work about? You know, and I was, I was from the background that, well, the art speaks for itself. You want to know what it's about? Look at it, study it. But, you know, we're in a different time. No, you, an artist has to be able to verbalize now and has to be able to articulate what that art is about. And, and I think it's a good thing because it, it puts you in control of your own narrative and your own story. And, and yeah, I, I remember um, uh, our last conversation, mm -hmm. um, you know, and speaking about art, mm -hmm. you know, and, and influences. You know, you, you had told me that after returning from Japan, I dug deeper into my African culture and my Cuban identity. Right. So talk to me about you, you know, digging into that culture and that identity and, and you know, yeah. you, you, you're, you're back in the Bronx now, you know, you, you're, you're a young man, you've got a young daughter, you know, where are you going with this? Yeah, yeah. You know? Because, you know, I think because of my background growing up um, and that multicultural milieu that was my family. Mm -hmm. That part of cultural exchange kind of came natural to me. Um, being able to almost like communion, like move between cultures. Um, so I, I, I kind of did not get very much resistance when traveling because it was easy for me to kind of meld with the environment around me. Um, but I began to realize really what I'm trying to move for is this kind of a cross-cultural experience. Um, and in order for to be effective in that type of a cross-cultural experience, it means you have to have something to cross over the other side, not just receiving mm -hmm. from the culture that you're uh, a guest at. You know, so after traveling the world and looking at all these different cultures, I began to realize I, I need something to, to kind of trade in a sense, to, to exchange. If it's going to be a real cultural exchange, it's not just about me coming to this culture and, and, and taking. I have to give also, bring something to the table. Mm -hmm. um, so that's when I, I started, uh, I, I, I made the decision to come back to, to dig deeper into that Afro-Cuban um, heritage. And I also had already kind of been starting the genealogical research um, in terms of, uh, you know, trying to find out where, where that, that comes from uh, genetically. Um, yeah, and you, you had told me that, um, you know, a, a, a lot of your interest in your, your culture came back, came from your grandmother you know, sharing, you know, what she learned from the uh, old Cuban cabildos. Right. You know, can you talk to us a little about that? Right. You well, I, this, this idea of cabildos, I, I really didn't uh, learn about until I returned to Cuba uh, in the 90s. Uh, I went, returned to Cuba, actually, I went to okay. Cuba for the first time. <laughs> it feels like a return um, because often, and, and it, it kind of echoes my experience in other cultures as well, um, but somehow Cuba in particular, um, although I had never been, when you arrive, people are there with open arms, like accepting a long lost relative, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of been my experience, even in cultures that I, that I don't have any connection with. Mm -hmm. um, people tend to, to be inviting in that way. Um, but I learned about the cabildos during, during, during the process of, of trying to study more about the Afro-Cuban um, experience. Got it. Um, because in Cuba, the slave experience uh, was quite different than the slave experience here in the United States. How so? Um, well, as, as we all know from our own education here in the United States uh, concerning slavery and whatnot, um, and, and if you grew up at the time that I that uh, probably you, you, you may remember uh, when Roots first hit the TV screen. You know, everybody knows about American slavery and, and the, the, the perils of that, how the family was broken up and, and uh, children were sent away and, and, and spouses were broken up and 
Whereas in Cuba, I think there was less of that happening. And often entire tribal affiliations were kept in intact. Um, so for that reason, you, you have actual tribal identities like Congo and Yoruba and Efik, Abakwa, uh, with their languages and their food ways and their religions and their musical ways intact. Um, and these were fostered by these so-called cabildos, which were kind of a, a brotherhood associations, the self-help organizations, um, which allowed the Africans to maintain their 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 uh, their cultures as 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 a, a living practice. Right. Um, and and even more so, that culture infiltrated into the greater national Cuban identity. So there's nowhere that you can go that people don't know Shango and Yemaya and Oshun, even though they talk about Santa Barbara and La Virgen de Regla and La Caridad de Cobre, they're really talking about the African uh, deities and, and, and that whole cultural influence in the Cuban vernacular, I think. Got it. Did you, be, before you went to Cuba and learned about the Cabindos and this Afro-Cuban culture, did your grandmother share any of that with you at all? Well, with my, grand, with my grandmother, it was more a thing of pop culture, if I can call it that, a popular Cuban culture of, of her time, um, which involved a lot of this kind of uh, ritual practice of My, my anthropological vocabulary is, is leaving me. Um, you know, alongside of the, the Catholic church going uh, practices that she had, because she had her own little shrine on her bureau in her bedroom. And, you know, she had these little rituals that she did at the beginning and the close of the years and with the entrance of the door and, you know, cleansing the house and burning incense. And, and uh, I think I, I, I think she even read people's cards because we always had this, the, the Spanish deck of, of cards, La Baraja, in the house. Uh, we played with regular cards, uh, rummy and, and, and poker, but we, all, we also always had the, the kind of the Spanish deck, which was used more like a tarot, like a re for reading. Okay. Yeah. Although I never saw her actually do that, I think, you know, I don't know why she had those cards, but she must have had it for a reason. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Now, uh, how did this, you know, Afro-Cuban identity and, and spiritualness, the, the, your spirituality, how did that affect or influence you, your art and you, your life? Yeah, well, um, hmm. It, 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 I think it marked a, just a new discovery for me. Um, A, a, I think a, a discovery of, or, or deeper understanding, I should say, maybe better, of, of uh, a side of my identity that I had only known through osmosis, mm -hmm. I think, if, for lack of a better word, you know, that, I've, that I only knew through living in the daily life of my family. Uh, because it's not something that they taught us in school. It's not something that we studied. You know, it was just part of the folk culture that that we lived around. Um, it had to be but, so but, different. But but in in in, in I, I remember it, it, again. It was about the time I came back from Japan, 1980. Now I co I come from the the to 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 kind of I alluded to earlier with the the whole rock and roll. Uh, background. I come from the, 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 the counterculture and the hippie movement by, by my own meanderings. Mm -hmm. um, so my introduction was through love beads and, you know, that whole hippie uh, expression. Mm -hmm. um, through Friends World College, when I first joined there and started traveling, uh, one of my classmates 
this 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 white girl from Long Island. I don't mean to to speak in that way, but I'm just talking about it because it was the times that we were living in. She taught me how to do the peyote stitch, which is a Native American technique, and I was kind of playing with that and doing all kinds of stuff. And at, a little bit earlier than that, my aunt, who was also doing beadwork back in the 60s and selling to the kind of African head shops, um, beaded jewelry. She gave me all of her beads. I inherited them from her, along with her record collection. Um, so I'm doing this on my own. And that year, I believe it was 1980, um, the Metropolitan Museum of Art opened the new Rockefeller Wing. And in that collection, he has all oceanic and African art that they've collected on all of their safaris. And mm -hmm. <laughs> There's another historical story that we can get into. Yeah. Too. That's another thing. <laughs> so I'm, 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 I, I go to this exhibit and they've got this, maybe about this tall, a huge Yoruba crown with birds and figures and colors and and i'm seeing i'm looking at these beads and i'm in a way i'm kind of is resonating with me because i know about the beads even though I'm, i was a hippie but i still had in my dna my genealogy and also from the neighborhood growing up around i know about the santeros and the beads that they're wearing and the colors of the chango red and white and yamaya is blue and oshun is amber and and i'm i'm, I'm looking at the crown coming out of Africa, maybe, I don't know, maybe 15th, 16th century. And it's like <clears throat> a mushroom cloud goes off in my brain. And it's like, I, I understood it. <laughs> and I started kind of experimenting with that, that beadwork. Um, and around that time, uh, I was beginning to network with uh, Baba Tony was, was one who I met around that time and people who were involved more directly in the, the Lukumi religion, mm -hmm. um, which is the Afro-Cuban, uh, which was brought here by the Cubans uh, and then adopted by the Puerto Ricans and the African-Americans here. Um, and I just had a facility with that. Uh, so I began, they began calling on me to create ritual objects. Um, and this was even before I was initiated into the, the tradition because I just had a, a knack um, for understanding the, 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 the aesthetic and the, the, the language, the visual language of that. Um, and the only, way, the only explanation I can have for that is that it comes to, through me from my DNA because nobody, I had never seen that before and nobody ever taught me how to do that. You know, maybe a past life experience or something, but that's another story. <laughs> Can you talk to us about, you know, thinking back on what led to you taking that trip to Brazil and getting initiated? Well, that a... well, I mean, that that is all part of that trajectory. Okay. Um, and uh, one of the first beaded pieces that I did outside of that was that the, the Caridad de Cobre, um, which I showed you earlier. Um, and I had made that for my mother, um, partly because I was just getting ready to go back to Japan um, after having been away for a, a year and eight months. And after the episode of having to leave the Bronx and, and here she is living in uh, 149th Street and Broadway now. Jose, we left off on speaking about spirituality and how it affected your your art career and your life in general. Um, mm -hmm. Pick up anywhere you like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think because uh, I think we were talking about because uh, I, I working working in that in that realm and and seeing uh, the original. Yoruba bead work um, just opened up a whole new realm of possibilities for me. Um, it, it, it resonated in me with me in such a way that um, it it almost felt like I had been there before, and 
uh, around that time, I was just beginning to meet people who were uh, working directly with the Lukumi uh, culture and system, uh, Baba Tony among, among them. Um, and they got kind of a, an inkling of what I was doing and enlisted me to begin making ritual objects and uh, regalia for the initiation of priests. And here I am, I'm a novice. I'm, I'm just beginning to learn about uh, this religion. Um, I was not born into it. Um, and other, other than the influences that come to me through the, the, the greater Cuban cultural identity, um, I was not privy to a lot of the, the in, inroads of this uh, religious practice. And they are very strict about insiders and outsiders. And I was most definitely an, an outsider, uh, a person who they term as Alejo. Alejo is, is a, a, like a novice who, who is not privy to. Um, so you, you have to go through a kind of a training period and, and a kind of a testing period before they open the door and, and let you in. Um, but through my work as an artist, it kind of bypassed all of that. And I was making objects and and uh, and items for for uh, senior priests. Um, um, so uh, after spending time uh, with that community in New York, uh, predominantly in Brooklyn, um, I was still feeling a lot pretty restless. You know, I come from a Catholic background. And I, and, and I moved away from that early on in my life. Um, I've, I've sought to understand uh, through my uncle, who, rest in peace, has influenced my thinking and my way of life a lot. Uh, my Hindu uncle who lived upstairs from us. You know, I, I, I learned a bit about uh, Hinduism and the Bhagavad Gita and, and all of that and, and Buddhism. Um, so I've been looking and comparing religions for a long time, and I, it was not really my intention to join strictly for another religious uh, institution. Um, but there was something about this, the cultural aspect of this that was speaking to me and calling me in a different way. Um, and it informed my art uh, a lot. Um, and uh, around that time, uh, we were getting a little bit of recognition um, in, in the museum world. Um, the, the, the godfather who I was with at the time, uh, his name is John Mason. He's a scholar and a, a writer. Um, as, as well as a, a curator of sorts um, around this Afro-Cuban uh, religion. Um, and he was able to open up a museum uh, track with the UCLA Fowler uh, over in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, and they commissioned me to do uh, some work for their permanent collection, uh, which is on the catalog for the exhibition, the cover of the catalog for the exhibition, Deeds, Body, and Soul. Uh, Art and Light in the Yoruba Universe, uh, wow. which was curated by my godfather, John Mason, and the anthropologist, Professor Henry Drew from uh, University of Wisconsin, uh, who I went to Wisconsin to work with. Um, and that, that, I think that exhibition kind of opened up a lot uh, because it was not really within the culture uh, but it was within the art world and academia. Um, so that kind of opened up a different road. Um, but in terms of the spiritual practice, I stayed in Brooklyn for a while um, and, and went through certain initiation rites of passage, preliminary rites of passage. Um, but when it came time to actually take that final step and be initiated as, as a priest, I, the road to Brazil opened up in front of me. Um, I know that maybe sound like an odd way of saying it, um, but I feel that 
in a way, that's been always my approach in my life. The road is opening up in front of me, and I'm just walking in the direction that's open. I'm, I'm not big on knocking down walls and climbing over mountains, <laughs> unless the mountain is the road that, that I'm going to. My destination is up there. Right. Um, that's how I find myself in Japan. That's how I find myself in Guatemala. That's how I find myself at Parsons. It's not like I did a lot of research and experimenting and saying, oh, is this the best option? Is this the best option? Or maybe, no, it just the road opened up in front of me and I just walked. And here I still am standing. <laughs> you know, and whether, whether that's good or bad, I really can't say. But that's the way that's brought me here to now. And I know other people who've had much bigger plans than I've had who are not anywhere near the plans that they started. Um, so I don't know, good or bad, it's what it is. Right. Can you tell us how, you know, not, now you're, you know, you're well informed, so to speak, you know, about your different interests, you know, how'd you get to Brazil? Did you get invited to Brazil? Was that something you did on your own? Now, now, now you're getting into esoteric philosophical conversations. <laughs> I don't know how much you know about uh, this this uh, religious practice, uh, Yoruba. It, no. It's hard. It, no. You can't really not ha nail it down, because with, without really getting into kind of a, a little historical background of it, it's it's a religion that comes out of Nigeria, number one, and it was brought to the new world uh, by the African slaves um, to places like Cuba, Brazil, uh, Haiti, to a certain extent, Puerto Rico, Trinidad, and, and other places where you may have found Yoruba people. But by far, Brazil and Cuba are probably the largest uh, enclaves of, uh, of uh, Yoruba diaspora uh, people. Um, so, there's a certain system in place. Um, just like in the Catholic Church, you know, you're born, you get baptized, you have to go to communion, you, got, you have certain rites of passage in, in, mm -hmm. in the way. Um, but the closest that we come to any kind of a reading or divination process is the confessional, where you go lock yourself in the room and then the priest is behind the door and you might hopefully get some kind of a message about your life and how you're supposed to live your life right now. <laughs> um, but in this system, we use divination. And you don't, you can't do anything without the confirmation of a divination uh, session and the confirmation, therefore, of the deity giving permission for you to take that path. Um, you can't just say, oh, I want to be a priest of Shango and I'm going to be a priest of Shango. It has to be kind of divined and, and read in that way. Um, so here I am in Brooklyn working with my godfather, John Mason, and every year we have a reading of the year on January 1st, very early in the morning with the sunrise. So you go for the reading of the year, and they do a reading kind of expansive. It's different from when you sit down for a personal reading, but he's still doing the reading of the year. So he reads for the house. And then he reads for the community and then the country and the world and just try to get an idea of how mm -hmm. this year is going to play out for us. So he's doing the reading of the year and everybody's gathered. And at this point, I'm already questioning my path. I'm already starting to... Uh, What's the word I, I want to find? Anyway, I'm, I'm questioning. I'm questioning my 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 path. Let's, let's leave it at that. Um, uh, if, I, if if I can, if I can digress a little bit, it's mm -hmm. like uh, Neo and Trinity in the Matrix, and Trinity tells him, "Is the question that drives us." <laughs> so I'm questioning my path, and in the reading. We're all gathered, and he's starting to 
break up a, a sweat there. And he looks up around and he says, one of you people around here is going to be leaving us. <laughs> and I'm saying, oh my God, he must be talking directly to me. <laughs> he says, you're going, to, you're going to be gone, but by the time you come back, you're going to be me. And, and it's, it's like, wow, how does he know that? Um, because I was already on the verge of making that decision to leave. And there, there might have been somebody else who was also experiencing the same thing. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But at, in, in that moment, I'm, that is speaking directly to me. Um, and, but I couldn't say anything yet. I, you know, I didn't dare breach that message yet. Um, but little by little, you know, one thing led to another. And, you know, I was kind of searching and seeking. And... Um, I went for a reading with somebody else who was Brazilian. Um, and the way his, his reading came out, he says, you're going to have three dreams. You know, and, and I guess you get a clue to what you need to do in those three dreams. So I had, so lo and behold, I had three dreams. And, um, and uh, without getting into too much detail about, uh, about those dreams, um, it's just uh, one thing that led to another. And um, the, 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 the high priest of the temple, uh, which I eventually was initiated, happened to be in New York. And um, we just made a connection. And in that, in that thing, in that, uh, transition, I just made the decision to, to go. And, um, again, the, the influence is in the art um, because just as I was a novice <clears throat> breaking the precedent because uh, it's unheard of for a non-initiate to put their hands on the head of a priest because the head is the sacred point for the Yoruba people. Um, that's the seat of your spirit and you don't let people touch your head. That's why they wear hats and stuff like that. Um, so that was unheard of for a, a novice to be making a crown to put on the head of a priest. That broke precedent. Yeah. In Brazil, for the for the ceremony, for the ritual ceremony, with, again through the divination, it came out. I had to make my own costume. For the for the orisha for the ceremony again this is not something that is done because you're not supposed to set eyes on your costume until the day of the initiation okay. it's kind of like a wedding you know you know right you know you're not supposed to be privy to anything until you pass through that door and you're initiated and accepted into the fold um so it was about and it was not because i chose that or i asked for that it's just like again, that's what opened up in front of me. So that that was my odu, odu. That was my my destiny in a sense. Let's not get carried away with that word because destiny is a matter of choice also. But <laughs> um, so I found myself in Brazil, and I wound up in Brazil. Uh, that was probably up until that time, aside from Cuba, the, the shortest trip that I ever took. How long? Maybe about three months. Oh, wow. That's... Yeah. Because my first trip that I ever took was to Guatemala, and that was a year. Um, and then Japan, a, a year and a half. So, yeah. I, I, you know, like I said, when I left the Bronx, I don't know how I did that. We were not people of means. Right. I had no way to get out of the Bronx. Not by any financial way, anyway. Right. Not, not student any, aid helped you out? Student aid helped me out. Um, but I think just having the gumption to step out, which was a rarity in, in my neighborhood. People, you know, you live in your neighborhood. You, your neighborhood's comfortable. You don't, my mother never left the square block that we lived on. Right. Now your your art, 
you know, um, and if you don't mind, I mean, you know, um, is Jose Rodriguez dash studio dot com. Right. Yeah, I, I, I noticed some just remarkable artwork in there. One, you know, I, I hope you would kind of, you know, explain a little, you know, the matriarchal throne. Can you talk to us about that? They, they, I, I have this this one piece. It's been exhibited a little bit here and there. Um, Matriarchal Throne. Um, that's one of the names that I've presented it by. Um, and it, uh, pretty much that piece is an homage to my, uh, my matriarchal family, my female lineage uh, that I come from. Um, and, and also a nod to the, the, the kind of the, 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 the beat culture that comes out of that, that African uh, identity. Um, but the, the, that piece is actually the, the central chair is borrowed from my own ancestral shrine at home, um, which I, uh, and, and I created that chair, uh, which is from, it, it was the last surviving piece, piece of furniture from the bedroom set um, that was handed down in my family and eventually, eventually wound up in my mother's bedroom. Um, but the chair was part of a vanity, uh, which doubled as my homework desk uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in public school. Um, so, I, so that chair was, was, was kind of very closely part of my, my daily life growing up in the Bronx. Wow. Um, but it was the only piece remaining um, from that that uh, huge uh, Victorian uh, chest with the gold the gold uh, uh, gold leaf uh, trim on, around the edges, mm -hmm. and you don't see those kind of furniture anymore too much. Right. Um, but but uh, uh, really finely carved, and it was it was kind of an antique, but it had been handed down in the family for so many <laughs> generations. The, the veneer was chipping here and there. <laughs> Um, so, so I, I use that chair uh, as kind of an homage to to my uh, female ancestry, um, and the 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 seat of the chair is is emblazoned with the the name Kuka, which is my grandmother's nickname. Her being the seat or the foundation of the family, and the back of the chair is emblazoned with my mother's nickname, Nina. Um, her being the eldest daughter and raised pretty much all of her other siblings as the, as the kind of the backbone of the family. Um, so I, I wanted something to kind of speak to the strength of that women's um, history of, of uh, you know, the powerful women. And, and, and I'm, you know, it's not unique to my family. I think it's, it's, it's the immigrant women and, and, and women of color all over, you know, hold our families together and, and, and keep us, uh, keep our cultures intact and, and, and keep our food ways and our, our practices, you know. That's beautiful. Um, a, a, another piece of art, you know, and, and I'll let you, you know, elaborate on the name, you know, uh, you do jewelry and there was a bracelet called the, and it, you know, please oh, correct, I, correct how actually, I pronounce it. I was it. wearing that today. The Ide Shango. Please get up. I have it here, actually. I took it off because it, it was a little loose. Awesome. I actually wore it today. That's awesome. We, it's show and tell today, guys. Show and tell. Yeah, I missed, I, uh, I missed my main show and tell with, uh, with Steve here. This is it. Wow. I, I actually, this is the Ide Shango. It snaps in there. Do you see the two Oshes? Oshe Shango, which is a double axe, it's a symbol of Shango, and is and the lightning bolt, the red and white, is Shango's symbol. What Shango? Shango is a, 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 translated as the, the god of thunder, if you can if you can put it into that language, um, and he's syncretized as Saint Barbara, um, but Shango is is uh, one of the Yoruba pantheon. Uh, it's just a, it's, it's a complex story. I, I'll just get a couple of details there. He was the third Alafing. Alafing is a kind of a chief or king of, he was the, the fourth Alafing, excuse me, of Oyo in Nigeria. Um, and he's one of the more popular 
uh, deities. Um, he's the owner of the drums, so anywhere that there's a, that drum music is involved in the in the the, the African tradition, uh, the Yoruba tradition, I should say, um, is Shango's realm. Yeah. So music and dance and thunder and lightning. He's also being a, a royal king. He's also it deals with ideas of justice and and the like. Um, but this is this is but ironically enough, although this is speaking about Afro-Cuban things, I made this in Okinawa. Okay. With, with my silver, I, I spent uh, seven. Uh, excuse me. I spent the, the the last several years apprenticing with the seventh generation royal silversmith um, to the the. Ryukyuan Kingdom in Okinawa. So wow. that's where I get my metalworking skills from. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Now, so, but th then again, this ties into that cultural exchange that I was talking about. Okay. So I'm right, learning right. my skills in Japan, traditional Japanese skills, but now I'm offering my own cultural uh, expressions with the skills that I've learned from them. So hopefully bridging more of that, uh, that gap there. Wow. Wow. And so you, I mean, you're, your artwork, I mean, extends, you know, be, beyond a throne and a bracelet. So, you know, this one title comes up in two pieces of your artwork. Mm -hmm. You know, the word Eshi, uh -huh. both in some more beadwork, right. you know, but also in some sneakers, you know, Eshu right. Walk Between Us. Right. <laughs> Talk to us about the inspiration to that name. And what is what does Eshu mean? Eshu. Eshu, also sometimes called Elegba, is... Another Yoruba deity is considered the god of the crossroads and thresholds. So, so anything that deals with encounters of people, where people come together, where people meet, government, crossroads, paths, that meeting point is the realm of Eshu. Is the space between us right now is, is Eshu. Um, he's considered a trickster um, in, in that regard. Um, and, and also, it as with a lot of these Yoruba deities, they, they, they play with gender roles. So he can, at times he's considered male, at times he's considered a female. However, he's very much a symbol of masculinity and he's often depicted, for example, with a, a huge heart on. Okay. So, because it's that idea of impregnating culture and, and impregnating society and, and the birth of civilization in that right. sense. Um, so the Africans, they like to play with puns and play long words. <laughs> got it, got it. Hence the, the pair of sneakers walking through that yeah. threshold. Well, the, the, see, the story is of Eshu Walk Between Us. That Those sneakers are not hence that. <laughs> okay. But it's hence just a, a kind of a mishap uh, relationship um, there's one one of the stories of, of that has to do with Eshu is that there are these two friends having a, a debate on the street corner which is that's right there that's Eshu's world you're on the street corner <laughs> so they're having this debate and here comes Eshu and he walks between them and he's got this hat where from, if you look at it from one side, it's black, and if you look at it from the other side, it's red. So he walks between these two friends who are already debating, and then they start seeing this guy come through, and, they, and, and then they start debating about this guy coming through, and they said, yeah, did you see the nerve of that guy? He went, walked right through us. He said, yeah, so he had a red hat on. And they said, what are you talking about? He had a black hat on. And then, lo and behold, the argument ensues, and a shoe walks between you, and you just don't see eye to eye anymore. So that that's what kind of a Got it. Uh, hence, <laughs> but it's based on that parable. But it's also hence personal experience and and what we call in Spanish fracasos. <laughs> right, right. Because right. sometimes you know you you have a relationship with someone and then as you walk between you and it's like, wait a minute, things are not the same anymore. Now, you, uh, again, back, back to your artwork, right? You, you have ritual object making, mm -hmm. such as 
throne and the mm -hmm. crowns and, mm -hmm. and the regalia. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you have your, your beadwork, you know, in, in your sneakers, your jewelry. But you also have watercolors. You know, can you... Well, watercolor was my first love. Okay. My first love, I think. Um, it's a good portable medium. Um, it was easy to travel with. Um, particularly in the time when, when we didn't have cell phones and cameras and stuff readily available. So I traveled with my watercolor set, and, and that's how I, I took pictures. That's how I documented uh, my travels. Um, yeah, so watercolor was like, uh, and, and then with my background in graphic design, um, not wanting to do advertising, but illustration was close enough. Um, so uh it was it was a good medium to document and to to illustrate um and it it also brought a certain amount of of work um because it's it's readily accessible i think to people um you know we have we have cd covers we have album covers we have book illustrations we have you know illustration is is a broadly marketable type of a, a career um, so it, it was helpful in that way, but I just love watercolor just as as a as a medium. Um, n never having really painted, I'm not a painter per se. Right. Um, well, I mean, I, I looked at some of your art. I'm going to name a couple of titles for you mm -hmm. in your artwork, and mm -hmm. choose the one you want to talk about. Okay. You know, they That's, were just interesting to me. Uh -huh. You know, Los Muñequitos. Los Muñequitos. Or, or Blues for Atlanta. Okay. Those are two very, they're kind of both dealing in a way with music, <laughs> but they come from very different uh, experiences. Um, the Blues for Atlanta came first. Okay. And I, I did that. It actually echoes uh, from a much earlier sketch that I had in my, in my high school sketchbook, um, a little pencil sketch that I had done um, based on the Billie Holiday song, Strange Fruit. And when I came back from Japan in the 80s, with all of the unrest and turmoil in, in the United States in general, um, and in, in the city in particular, um, there, was, there was an incident going on in Atlanta, Georgia, um, where these young black boys were being killed, and, and nobody was understanding where that was coming from or who was doing it. And, and it went on, for, if I remember correctly, it went on for months to the point where people were walking around with the green ribbons, the green symbolic of hope, um, that, that they would soon find this, uh, this uh, killer and, and get to the bottom of it. Um, so with that in the, in the air, um, I, I revisited that original sketch from Billie Holiday um, because the, the picture depicts a lynching um, and then the family is in in awe and sadness, looking up at the, the black body swinging in the southern breeze, you know, from to quote Billy Holiday's song. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time, you know, because of the conditions that I was living in in the Bronx, a lot of my work was more kind of social commentary and and making some kind of political uh, statement. Um, and even to this day, I think that I like to use, you know, juxtapose some kind of a social comment, um, not necessarily in the Muñequitos one, but a similar image uh, of a woodcut that I have of a bomba uh, out of the, the, the Afro, Afro Puerto Rican uh, musical form. Um, and in that image, um, I tried to bring the image down to the ground um, because it's a very earthy music. The drum and the beat of the drum is very down close to the ground. So I brought the whole perspective down and the main thing in the image is the dancer's feet. But in the background, you see the two drummers underneath her skirt. One of them has these real fancy uh, two-tone quarter band shoes on. Mm -hmm. Style and profiling, you know, with, that, his, yes. with his ghetto high life going on, and the other one is more raw. He's barefoot and playing on with his feet on the on the ground. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I what I was trying to 
present there is a juxta juxtaposition of, of, of culture and civilization, you know, where civilization tends to be this kind of a top-down conforming type of a culture, whereas the, the culture that I was more drawn to and interested in was like more evolving and grassroots from the ground up type of a culture. Right. Um, so the conflict with civilization and culture. And again, we see that in, 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 in the movings of the world. It's like I, I was teaching English in Japan and, and just about what we're talking about today with, with Gaza and the, all, all in the Middle East, there was, a, there was a book that my students came up with. I was teaching these college professors. They were doctors and stuff, and they wanted a reading club. And they came up with a book, Clash of Civilizations. Okay. And it was all about the United States vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East and, and Arab cultures. And, 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 and now we see that actually coming head to head. You know, the, the, this was pre-Osama bin Laden. And, and that whole 9-11 thing. So we saw that come to a head, the clash of civilizations uh, with 9-11. It. But it's still going on, you know, with Gaza and with, you know, we still see the clashing of the civilization. So I, I try to, aside from, although my work is very spiritual and, and I, I, I aspire to that and try to bring that to, pe to the, my work, Inevitably, the circumstances that we live in creeps in, and I, I have to say something about, it. you know, through, through, you know, through, through the language of art, you know, through the right. language of color and, and visual and composition.